very good. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Samantha Jarvis. I am with Broward County's Natural Resource Division. Um, let me go ahead. I don't need to see my face. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen instead. And that way, let's see. Oh, I guess you can already see it a little bit. Okay, we'll do this. All right. So I'm going to touch base with you all about manatees and mangroves. Um, so we've got a little bit of different spectrums um, with, with what we're talking about, but there's actually a lot in common. Um, so I, I'm going to go ahead and give a little bit of the background biology um, and as well share as threats and ways that we can help our manatees and mangroves. Um, so as I said, I'm a natural resource specialist with Broward County's resilient Environment Department. Um, and basically, we work together um, with a lot of natural resource man management um, professionals and basically study, manage, and protect all of these natural resources. We've got forestry, um, land management, air quality, wildlife. That's that's my, my love, my baby. Um, I actually went to school in New Mexico, but I, I just since I was a little kid, I always wanted to work with marine. So um, down here now, um, we actually have um, a different division that works specifically with aquatic and wetland resources. So they get all the water quality um, and seagrass surveys um, and any of the construction that goes on the water, it, it goes through that permitting group. So it's a lot of back and forth reviewing permits and working together. Um, but living in Florida, South Florida, we have a lot of amazing different natural resources. So I have the opportunity um, to work with, you know, the mangroves um, if I'm out doing any inspections. Um, and we can use these as bioindicators to assess the quality of the environment and how it's been changing over time. So. Uh, beaches and sand, the Everglades, all of those good things too. So if you are very curious about any of our other natural resources, we can always talk, talk about those after uh, the presentation. But let's get to manatees first. Um, I know you're, you're having a virtual um, presentation for me. I'm going to try to put, I put a lot of photos. Um, manatees aren't easily accessible to Broward County. We don't have a viewing center in our county. Um, we don't have them year round. So I hope you enjoy some of these photos and basic biology um, and we'll go from there. So manatees are actually in a group from uh, what they call the Sirenia group. Um, back in Christopher Columbus days, he thought he saw a mermaid. It was not a mermaid. Um, Maybe it was, but realistically, we have our siren group. Uh, stellar sea cow, that, that is our, our extinct big mama there, about 30 feet long, eight to 10 tons, um, officially was discovered um, 1768, or I'm sorry, was extinct by 1768. Um, it was only known for about 30 years on, on record. Um, it was um, hunted for hides, the, the fat, um, meat, most likely, I know some, different parts of the world still do eat relatives of uh, our Florida manatee, probably well, West African manatee. Um, but it's possible also um, if, if people were over harvesting otters that the otters were eating our, you know, that they were going and um, lack of food due to urchins eating all that kelp. And then it's, it's possible. Oh, I'm sorry, let me take that back. Possible lack of food due to urchins eating kelp from the over harvesting of otters. So lots of factors, um, but basically they, the Florida knew that uh, we were losing after that, we, we needed to protect our manatees. Okay. Um, we are in Florida, you all know this because I think most of you will be from Broward area, but if anyone's tuning in from other part of the state, we are down or parts of the world. I know um, the Wildlife Center has a big following I saw on social media. We're down by the shell here. Um, and well, I'm in Fort Lauderdale, but Broward is pretty much over there. And manatees can go through the whole state of Florida um, and even on the coast up through um, the Gulf and Atlantic coast. Uh, we've had one up in Chesapeake Bay even. So um, basically they'll be found in shallow rivers, estuaries, canals. Um, they're all around. 
migrating to the warmer waters because they cannot withstand temperatures of the water um, below 68 degrees. So we know when there's a cold snap coming through, we say manatees are coming down. If it gets warm, we know that they're going back up and out from those warmer water areas um, because they are marine mammals, but they're different than other marine mammals. So um, as I mentioned, the Sirenia group, we've got a manatee, the dugong. Uh, there's a few differences with dugongs. Um, and then we have our whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And the biggest difference, well, there's a few, but these guys have blubber and manatees do not. I know they're chunky and they're floaty potatoes is what they call them, but it's actually not fat. It's mostly digestive tract. Um, so that's a big difference of why you will not see a manatee over in the colder waters over in California. Um, we just don't have, they can't withstand those cold uh, temperatures. And then we have our carnivores. So our otters, which we do have river otters, polar bear we do not, and the seals and sea lions. So this is kind of goes over the mammals, depending if you're all volunteers, you know mammals. Um, I, if I'm working with little kids, I try to see how long they can hold their breath for. This is a fun one. Um, but ideally, manatees are going to go underwater. Um, if they're resting, they can stay under for 20 minutes. But if they're, I'd say, moving around a lot, depending, you know, maybe they're mating, they'll come up every three to five minutes. So uh, real quick, you'll see their little snout, that little coconut ball come on up. They open, they have the adapt adaptation that they'll just go ahead and open up that nostril in the second they hit the water it closes automatically, which is pretty cool. Um, so average adult is about well over a thousand pounds. Um, babies are a little smaller, three to four feet. Um, so they are what my boss says, you know, about as big as three biologists. Uh, but if you're, you're lifting these guys, it takes a, a good 10 to 15 people to help move a full-size manatee back into the water. Fun fact. Uh, manatees, they don't sound like, I, I, again, if I ask the kids, what do they sound like? Some people think they roar. Some think that they, um, you know, basically are like a dolphin and do that annoying chatter. But no, they've got these cute little chirps and whistles. And there's a lot of really good bioacoustic, if that's something you're interested in. Lots of research going on right now. And it's the cutest little squeaks you've ever heard. Um, but definitely not what you'd think would come from a large animal like that. Speaking of our, our squeaky little babies, um, love these photos. <clears throat> so while manatees are herbivores, uh, they will, the babies will stay with mom for about two years and they actually nurse from the flipper side. Um, so sometimes they think you, you hear people saying, oh, they're hiding, they're so cute. No, they're just hungry. Um, and that's pretty much, they'll stick with mom and try to go find those warmer water edges of the canals. Um, it, it, they like to go into what we call a nursery. So anywhere that they can be safe and quiet, that's where they'd like to go. Um, you can't tell a manatee's age unless, weird fact, their ear bone. Um, like a tree, they've got little rings, so you can't tell the exact age unless you do you know, a dissection. Um, but the babies, you can tell because they'll be smaller and they're actually darker in color. Um, so that's a good rule of thumb that I try to tell people if they're not sure. Sometimes they think it's a full, a full grown manatee is stuck, but it's, they think it's a baby, but in, in fact, it's, you know, a 10, 20 year old, give or take. So small and dark and will most likely be by a mom. As I said, they're herbivores. This is an awesome photo. Uh, we don't have these luxurious looking grass, uh, seagrass beds. I wish we did, um, but it's something that is of great importance. And I'll talk a little bit later of how we can protect the seagrass beds. Um, but as I said, Broward hasn't been affected with any seagrass loss like the other parts of the state. All right, so we talked about mangroves, um, are going to talk about mangroves, but this photo is, it always catches my eye. Um, they can use their lips like an, I wouldn't say like an elephant, but their elephant is their closest cousin. Uh, they're actually very closely related and they can use their, their mouths as prehensile grabbers and they can go and grab vegetation that's floating or growing over the canals. So sea grapes, they love those. Um, anything that's overhanging, um, basically it's, it's a nice tool for them, but they are related, so. Um, 
So speaking of that, the, they eat all their veggies, but if they are foraging on the bottom for seagrass, um, they are one of, I think there's only two other animals uh, that have what we call marching molars. So as the sand gets into their teeth and they're eating that seagrass and it's wearing down the molars, they're constantly losing teeth and growing back molars. So really crazy adaptation that a lot of other animals do not have. We definitely don't have them, um, but marching molars, um, really cool little fact. And the flippers. Uh, so manatees, as I said, they're related to elephants. They do have nails. Um, so that's from them, you know, being able to move around on the ocean floor um, and it move and it keeps them short by getting nice little manicure, pedicure from the seagrass and wearing those down. And that's a, um, basically if you were to look within an x-ray, they do have those fingers inside that flipper. So that's pretty cool. Okay, um, let's see here. So this is actually my boss. Um, so this is at a release. Um, and I'm going to focus on what we call the paddle. This is very, very, very strong tail. Um, if you ever see a group of mating cavorting manatees, um, that's a thousand pound animal that can whip you, especially when they have no idea what else is going on other than the goal to mate. So um, when you're releasing a manatee, it takes a lot of people to kind of hold this guy down before you can get into the water. Um, and they put a satellite tracking tag on. So that's what that is right there. Um, and she actually works at Clearwater Aquarium. They have a really good um, tracking team and they follow all these different manatees and do a bunch of reports. So you can follow up with Clearwater um, Aquarium if you're interested in learning more about that. But if the tag happens to get snagged on something, it pops right off. So no harm to the manatee. Um, also, the orange little markings, if you didn't know, that's how people um, with, with the researchers uh, group, at, either at Moat or Clearwater, um, will go ahead and ID the manatees and follow up with them years later, they can go ahead and track them by their scars. So it's a little gruesome to think how many have that many scars, um, but eventually that it's just like a chalk paint. Um, so let's see if this video will work, I hope so. All right, so you'll see, notice the tail. It's going to leave those big, what we call footprints. So while um, they're big circle bubbles, that's a perfect one right there. So people say, well, how do I know if a manatee is here, if it's down on the bottom of the, the ocean floor or on, um, through the inner coastal? If you look for those big circles, those footprints, it's a good indication that there's a manatee underneath and that's kind of just leaving his little marks. Um, so that's a good indicator for that. Oh, I did it again. I don't need to do it again. There we go. Okay. So we talked a little bit more about manatees, uh, their 101 uh, biology. I'm going to touch a little bit about the different type of mangroves, which look at this beautiful photo. Um, mangroves are a magical forest where we discover, uh, oh goodness, nature's secrets. They straddle the connection between land and sea and nature and humans. Mangrove forests nurture our estuaries and fuel our nature-based economies. Uh, I heard that quote the other day, maybe, and I thought it was perfect, um, especially because you know we're we're trying to reduce all of these um, construction and development and protect the mangroves and and for good reason. Um, so we'll go ahead and touch a bit about that, and then even more about the other threats to mangroves and manatees um, and how we can help them. All right, so if you remember the manatee map, the mangrove map looks very similar. Um, that's because it's the same type of temperatures. You get the, the salt water, um, the fresh water mixing together in those estuaries. Um, mangroves are a group of salt tolerant trees. They're found mostly in the coastal zone of tropical and subtropical latitudes uh, worldwide. So they grow in salt water. Uh, scientists refer to them as the blue carbon ecosystems, almost how we say trees are more of the green, um, ab absorbing all that carbon, but they are right there in the water as the blue um, carbon ecosystem. They can store three to five times more carbon per unit than other tropical forests. Um, so very important. Okay. 
these should look familiar to you if you've ever gone out um, on one of the state parks. I know we've got them everywhere down here. Um, and you can normally smell them too. Um, but these ones are the red mangroves. These are what they call the walking trees, um, big old roots um, popping up from the bottom. They have the large waxy leaves. Um, you'll see them, uh, the prop, the propagals are, are they basically are the enlarged green beans. You'll find them floating. Um, and, and they're always the ones that the mangroves that are up front with the harshest conditions. They're the ones at the front that are getting hit by big waves and the hurricanes are taking that bear, um, all the burden from all the big storms that we get. Those large prop roots, the, um, they grow out and over and, and they increase the area above the water. So they get more oxygen that way through the pores in the bark. And then um, you can see all the cool different, I mean, what do we got? The, the little crabs that live in there. Um, I've seen snakes. It's just the, a great ecosystem um, for different algae and animals to live in there. Okay, and then these creepy looking ones, these are the black mangroves, they grow straight up. Um, so these ones, they have pneumatophores and that's where um, they're basically coming up from the soil um, they slip beneath the surface and then they'll shoot up from out of the ground and actually one tree can have over a thousand uh, of these root systems coming on up. Uh, the leaves are pretty similar to red, um, but mostly white underneath. So that photo, you can see they're pretty white. Um, and I have not licked one, but I heard if you do, they're pretty salty. So let me know if you try that. Um, I've tried other um, vegetables and, and different things that are growing out in the forest, but not, not a mangrove yet. Um, so, uh, let's see. And then they'll get white flowers, um, and, and tear dropped green seeds, which I don't think I have a photo of that one, but our white mangrove. So these are a little bit more, uh, tree like, uh, very good pollinator, uh, flowers that, uh, the white flowers, um, let's see, they act as a catchment system for some pollutants in the environment. They will actually get them because they're closer, uh, upland. So they'll get more of those pollutants before they enter the marine environment. And um, that, that's great because it will hopefully catch it before it affects uh, the marine wildlife. Um, there's bolts or notches at the base of the leaves. And those are called extra floral nectaries. Um, so a lot of people you can smell, you see a little base down there. And then I found this poem, which I thought was great. So <laughs> Sanibel Sea School has a lot about mangroves um, and shells and a bunch of other wonderful things. But so red, red, pointy head, black, black, salty back. There you go. And then white, white bolts on tight. So if you're ever out there and you can remember, um, almost like you've got the coral snake little uh, limerick, anything like that to help you remember is pretty helpful. Okay. So here's a nice um, infographic that shows everybody together. So you can see how in the zonation, red mangroves are going to be down there. Um, they'll basically, it depends on the land elevation, water, soil, salt levels, and the tidal changes of where they're going to be. Um, they're really tough trees. They'll get daily flooding from the ocean. Um, even if it was fresh water, flooding alone to any other um, type of plant like this would probably kill them and drown them. Um, and, you know, mangroves, they, as I mentioned, they, they brunt the ocean storms and, and they actually help prevent erosion as well. So um, planting these are very important for your, you know, if you live on the water, go ahead and try to get these going um, and protect them. Um, so let's see. Okay, this is one of the best slides because it shows everything in one, um, but as we know, the, the, the benefit for wildlife alone is a nursery habitat for fish, um, the dead leaves and twigs that fall that, as I mentioned, they're smelly, um, you know, all of the dead decaying materials, food for microorganisms that are going to go and eat it um, and, and produce food for all of the fish that keep laying their eggs and spawning, um, so different species might be there year round or they'll just use it depending on when they're breeding. Um, but also for our um, for commercially recreationally, um, that's that's not just for the wildlife but for for people that are living um, that need to make their livelihood off of fishing around um, you know blue crab, shrimp, red drumfish, um, a number of mangroves they actually have substances that show um, antibacterial or antifungal properties. 
I know there's, I, again, I have not tasted it, but you can make certain teas. Um, some people and parts of the world, they swear that it's great for um, helping with headaches or indigestion. So another, you know, lots of plants we know have medicinal qualities and it just keeps adding to the list of um, benefits. Um, so unfortunately we, we have to touch the threats to get to the good part of how, how we can help them. Um, but I tried to go and compare manatees and mangroves together. Um, and I did find a lot of similarities of putting them together of, of the same um, impacts. So this is a photo of Port Everglades. Um, you can see in the yellow, that was original manatee habitat. Uh, goodness, I think within you know over a hundred years, it's definitely dwindled, and the manatee nursery area is it's all protected in that those um, those mangroves actually down there. We call that the nursery. So when it gets cold, that's where a lot of manatees we know are going to go and hang out, and they know that that's a safe area to have babies, and um, that's actually where the FWC Florida Fish and Wildlife. Um, their unit is located there. So a lot of rescues and releases happen in that, that present manatee habitat right there. Um, then the Florida Marine Research Institute reports that 86% of the mangroves present in Florida um, since the 40s have been lost. So um, habitat development, we, we, you know, no stranger to us down here. It's a constantly uh, developing and now people are just building up because they're running out of space on land. So now things are just getting taller. Uh, litter and pollution, this is the one that, you know, we try to promote going plastic free. Um, it, it's, it's something that you see every day. Um, but basically, uh, with this pelican, um, the black mangroves, that's a that's an area where um, pelicans actually will roost and the brown pelican will lay or, you know, have their babies there. And the man, um, the volunteer, I have a quote, said uh, that they freed more than 50 yards of fishing line from the tree so other birds would not become entangled when they came to roost. Every evening, more than 400 birds roost on this small island. So you can only imagine how many, you know, just from one, one person being careless and losing fishing line overboard um, or not picking it up when it blows over um, can endanger a lot of wildlife that way. Um, in our manatees, we know we see a lot that become entangled. Um, pollution in general is just a nasty, nasty thing. Um, so you can also get water quality pollution, um, fertilizer runoff. So that's that leads to other issues such as red tide. We don't necessarily get red tide too bad over on this coast, but if you're familiar over in the Tampa area, they, they can get hit pretty bad. Um, and it, just to lay it on a so little thicker. So from figure. Oceano's review, it's entitled oh, Choke sorry. Strangle <laughs> in 2020. They found Stephanie. that at least 700 Florida manatees fell prey to plastics over that period from 2009 to 2020. And nearly all of them, 99% had swallowed some type of plastic. Uh, among the types of identifiable plastics consumed by those animals, they found included bags, balloons, recreational fishing line, sheeting, and food wrappers. Uh, they also found quite a few common items entangling those animals, including plastic packing straps, bags, and balloons with strings. And as you can see from this graphic, our Florida mascots, our sea turtles and manatees are the highest plastic consumers out of this study and review. We can so, I do apologize that slide I, I borrowed from one of our other <laughs> presentations about um, going plastic free, but it doesn't change any of the facts there. Um, so. Uh, just another reason, it's it's not just um, manatees and, and seabirds, we get sea turtles, um, basically whatever we find on the beach um, is ingested plastic most likely. Um, and we also have our climate change uh, as one of our threats associated issues that come with climate change. Um, specifically manatees, um, you know, with those unseasonal temperatures that come from climate change, um, you get the uh, cold stress syndrome. So if we know that a cold snap is coming, a lot of manatees that can't get to those warm water refuges or uh, travel fast enough, if they've got other illnesses, they might get cold stress, which means they basically become um, paralyzed. Um, well, 
I take that back. They, they, um, their skin starts to slough. They can't metabolize their food well. So um, then they'll go ahead and start losing weight. Um, and they also get what they call peanut head. Um, so they look very skinny. Um, the red tide is what's going to cause um, more of a neurotoxin. So they're unable to hold their head up to breathe and then they might drown. So um, increased storms means increased runoff. So do not use the fertilizer. Um, but then you also have these manatees that get stranded because you get sea level, um, you know, the water will rush in, start rising. And then as it starts to go back out, these manatees get stuck in the most crazy places, um, golf courses after getting through the canals, um, some get over oyster, um, what are they called? Um, basically just anywhere that a manatee can swim over, the water recedes and then they get stuck. So that's always an interesting rescue. Um, but the mangroves um, are really important because if they can go ahead and remove the carbon from the atmosphere, um, you know, that that's kind of going to help. So um, ideally that's not so much, um, we, we need to keep the mangroves in order to help reduce the carbon and um, greenhouse gas emissions that it's all one big circle. Okay. This was an interesting one for me to connect because um, I said, well, what can boats do to mangroves? Um, well, we have a lot of derelict uh, vessels that actually um, occur, um, whether people just don't wanna pay for them and maintain them anymore. Um, I think I saw actually in June, they're, they're passing. So now there will be an act, I believe that fish and wildlife can um, remove these vessels or they make it easier to do so. But because there wasn't really a program to remove them, there was about se over 700 of these things in the state just crashed and, and left to sink. Um, you know, hopefully oils weren't being dumped and chemicals, but it, it was hard to say, um, but definitely harmful to habitat, which, so I threw that one on there. Um, and unfortunately we are all familiar with um, all of the boat collisions for our scarred up manatees. And um, one that people don't put into consideration is um, if a manatee gets hit from the front hull of a boat, um, they can actually damage inside, uh, whether a rib will puncture a lung or any other internal damage. So if you would see a manatee that's floating awkwardly on its side, that means that he cannot um, maintain his buoyancy is off. Um, and, and that's a rescue that will need to take place. So it's not necessarily always those propellers, um, the collisions might damage otherwise and, and make it so that they can't submerge or whatnot. So. Um, I always share that one as well. There you go. Okay. Okay. So I touched base very quickly because now I got to get to all of our programs um, of what we do in Broward County to help protect manatees and mangroves. Um, my specific role is the education and awareness component for our manatee protection plan, the MPP. Um, as I mentioned, the state in 1989 said, how are we going to protect these manatees? We knew that they were getting hit by boats. They had all of these threats that were occurring. Um, so Broward uh, and alongside 12 other counties incorporated this manatee protection plan. So we have all these different attachments that go through um, that basically um, lots of studies and biology uh, reports and assessments to come up with what is going to be the best way to help protect manatees um, and, and how we do that in Broward County. Uh, we have, and I'm, I'm sure if you're boating or if you know fishing, um, you know, good spots, you will see these signs posted everywhere. So we have speed zones. Along with those speed zones, we also have a deputy um, that goes and patrols through manatee season. Um, but you can get pulled over if you're going too fast also by fish and wildlife or other marine uh, patrol units, but this is a, this is a big one. Um, we know where the manatees go, and I'll share that in a couple of slides, and where their, um, we call them areas of special concern, because they are the travel corridors for these manatees to get to the warm water refuges. Um, but these are really important. Uh, Fish and Wildlife actually maintains these signs, so if you see one is, you know, knocked over from a hurricane, let, you know, I can go ahead and contact the state for you, but they're the ones that maintain these signs. Um, out on the waterway. Okay, so this is where we have our county waterways. The county is actually split up 
from our plan into about three main sections. And then we have the areas of special concern. So the light blue, I'm gonna have to move this guy over. Okay. So the north zone and central zone, not too, not too busy. We've got Hillsboro through Pompano. Central comes down. The blue is where you get to Port Everglades. So we do have warm water um, that comes out of the port, and that is a known area that's protected for manatees. And then if you go over to the left, you'll see there's a big blue. Um, it's a lake, basically. We call them the cooling lakes from the old power plant that used to be there, just in the South Fork New River. It's over by um, Secret Woods Nature Center, if you're familiar with that. Um, that is from an old power plant that still discharges uh, the warm water because we know that manatees go there. Um, but that is basically protected. There can be no uh, construction allowed over there for um, any boats because that's where that is. So this is how we break it up when it comes to knowing um, how many boats are allowed in each zone. So I actually manage our, there we go, <laughs> the MOFL, the manor, or the Marine Facility Operating License. So in order to have a funding component of our plan, uh, there was a lot of boat studies done to see how many slips where a boat can park um, would require a license with an annual fee to help mitigate any construction or um, damage that could be done um, in manatee habitat. So here is, uh, let's see, so I'm up to 454 properties that have five or more slips. Um, this includes the city marinas, um, multi-family unit properties, big condos, so anything like that should, it will have a license. Um, and I do education, I provide them signs specifically for how to be a better boater, um, any of the boat ramps. So even if people come and are from out of town and rent a boat, ideally they're looking at these signs to give them a heads up about manatees. Um, but I, I track all the slips in the county. So that is our funding mechanism. It's $32 per slip. But some of these properties have over, you know, two, three hundred boats uh, slips. So, so we do get a good amount of money um, and try to give back to any of our, um, you know, manatee nonprofits that we can. Okay, one of the fun things I get to do uh, during manatee season um, and part of the plan is to monitor the population. So, I think when this plan started, we had about maybe three to four thousand uh, statewide. Um, and now I know the manatee, I don't know from the, the latest number, but we were over 6,000 in 2020, I believe was. Um, so the population has gone up and we know because of doing these annual flights, um, actually weekly flights during season, that we can get over a third of the population of all the manatees in Broward, depending on the temperatures. Um, so it is a little hectic. You're flying around in a helicopter, trying to count manatees. Um, so taking photos like this and going back, you can try to look under shadows and see if you can guesstimate of how many there are. Um, and we report those numbers on our website and then send them to the state. So I will share, this is what it looks like in the back of the helicopter. And we, this should be, so there's the port. So this is, oh goodness, the Dania City Marina, I believe on your right. So just a quick clip, but it shows you have the intercoastal, you have the marinas, and then you even have the ocean side. So we're counting all the waterways in the county um, and, and flying to see if we can get a good estimate of what how many manatees we have um, and also report if we see any that are injured or need rescue. Oh, come on. Okay. So season comparisons, um, as I mentioned, we can guess when we know the manatees are going to be down in Broward because of how the temperatures are going. Um, but some years we get warmer, you know, we don't get um, that cold winter that I really wish we would get just because I'm sick of the heat. But um, let's see, so 2015 to 2016, I think there's a typo on that blue one, but that must have been a really cold winter. We had that between January and February, almost 900 manatees that were counted. Um, but then it must have warmed up by March because towards the end, all of those manatees 
had headed back out, either they went back down to the Keys or they went to Northern Florida. Um, so it's interesting because you know, from, from a standpoint for outreach and education, we can warn voters as much as we can, whether it's through news outlets, uh, we have radio ad campa campaigns that I can try to push, um, letting voters know, okay, well, it's going to get warm. We know the temperatures are rising, manatees are going to be moving back out. Um, so really keep an eye out. Um, we know when it's really cold, they should be staying put over by the port or by the other warm water um, outlets. But Whenever you get those fluctuations, these manatees are going in and out and in and out. Um, and here's a good photo to show just a little bit about how we take those uh, numbers and, and um, the monitoring and, and plotting them on a map so we can see where manatees are going, what travel corridors they're taking. Uh, the big chunk on the right shows those cooling lakes and then also for Port Everglades because we you know, we know that's where the manatees are, but it is interesting to see them go up and down the intercoastal. So we know that's where we really need to push having more patrols, uh, more awareness, whether it's signage or whatever we can do with, you know, for me, I'd like to go out and try to talk to restaurants that are on the waterway, um, because those are really the people that are going to be having eyes on the water more than what I can do. Okay. Um, so that's a little tidbit about our manatee protection plan. Um, I, I had to tap in with our permitting group to see how they uh, mitigate for any mangrove. Um, I, I always knew that that was a protected species and you had to get permits uh, to do any, um, it, which is actually really interesting if you know anyone that's looking to get some sort of training. Um, you can be certified to watch people trim mangroves and you get paid to look and make sure people are cutting everything correctly. Um, because there is a mangrove trimming and preservation act. Um, so basically, um, FDEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, is the primary agency responsible for anything um, with trimming and alteration of mangroves. But Dade, Broward, Pinellas, uh, what else we got here? Indian River Shores, there's a few others that have their own local government um, that will go ahead and, and implement that act. So we're one of them. So um, this is kind of just an idea um of, of what can be trimmed um, and having the permit that tells you what you can do um, or any mitigation um, that will need to be done um, so i do know if you happen to live on the waterway um, and you have mangroves on your property that you'll need to go ahead and apply for what we call an environmental resource license all of these licenses are available on our website, um, but you can also email the Aquatic and Wetland Resource Group directly at that email down there or shoot me an email and I can connect you. Um, but any of these things, if you're going to even put, um, you know, um, build a seawall or fix a dock within the area of your mangroves, it's a good idea to go ahead and, and contact us or your, your city first to see what type of permit is uh, needed and we'll be able to help you out with that. Okay, um, and how can you help? Okay, so um, I, I, I always hate going over all the threats because it sounds so doom and gloom, but there really are a lot of good programs and, and volunteer opportunities. Um, we know this, especially if you're volunteering with the, the Wildlife Center and all the animals that get entangled. Uh, but I do have to push our, our coastal cleanup. That one's coming up September 17th. I will be the captain, I think, either in Pompano or Lauderdale by the Sea. Um, but that's a really fun one. Um, you know, any of the waterway cleanups or any cleanup in general, because we know it all ends up in the water. So that's a good do. Oh, cute. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, the fishing line, um, we do have the opportunity to recycle this fishing line. Um, once it goes into these bins, if you find it, even if you're not a fisherman, fisherwoman, you can put it into these bins and it gets remade into other, either more fishing line or whatever they can do out of it. So um, real, it says no garbage. I see things piled in garbage um, inside of there all the time, but ideally telling more people, this is where you can go. So if you know any groups of boaters um, or neighbors that like to go fishing, remind them to, to stash that trash and they can recycle when they're done. And this is oh so so dear to me. Um, I get a lot of sweet little Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts that say, "Oh, we we fed the manatee lettuce, or we gave him a hose." And 
it's it's a sweet gesture, but I have to remind them, please do not touch them. Please do not feed or water them. Um, manatees are actually really resourceful at finding fresh water. Um, half the vegetation they eat, uh, they don't need to have water. I mean, they like it because they're like puppies. So anything that, you know, they'll be used to coming up to you for water if you teach them that. Um, but if you're going kayaking, you know, um, I've seen people on paddle boards that take selfies with manatees all the time, which is kind of cool um, because they are curious. They're going to come up to you. Um, but yeah, just look, don't touch. And this is a new slide I put on here with the mangroves. Um, really cool stuff happening um, in West Palm Beach. There's this group called Mang, and you can actually help plant mangroves or become a volunteer to help start getting them propagated. Um, so anytime, and I'm not saying go out and buy their stuff, but they do give back and, and, and they there are other groups that are doing this or planting living shorelines. Um, so not only is this good for businesses on the water or homeowners that are trying to help with, um, you know, resilience projects, but it's going to go ahead and give habitat, uh, clean, cleaner air, cleaner water, all that good stuff. Um, it's really cool. And actually, um, I don't know if anyone's in Pompano. I just saw that their city, they'll be having a local tree event. And they're going to teach you how to plant your own um, because you basically just find one of those little property tools and you can stick it in water and it's supposed to just root. I've not tried it myself, but if it's really that simple, then um, I, I feel like this could be a really good um, program um, all over the state. Okay, uh, almost done. Let me see what time I have. Okay, so we can get to questions in a bit. Um, how else can you help? This is just something, uh, Broward County actually just passed a policy for county properties that um, single use plastic straws, stirs, styrofoam, confetti, and sky lanterns are prohibited. Um, I was really hoping we would get balloons on that list. It did not get passed, um, but being the uh, stewards that we all are, we don't need a policy to do these things. Um, reusable shopping bags um, for manatees and actually all wildlife in the water. Uh, wear polarized sunglasses. It helps for if, um, the glare, uh, cuts it back down so you can actually see clear in the water. Um, the boating speed zones, don't release balloons. Um, and this is kind of stuff that we tell kids, you don't need confetti, you can blow bubbles. Um, you know, I, I've seen people make confetti out of, um, like dried leaves. There's so many other ways to celebrate than all of these um, harmful single use plastic things out there. And then lastly, um, just because this, you know, manatee um, or, or sea turtles, you can report um, injured or dead manatees on the um, through fish and wildlife conservation. Uh, we also have a mobile app that I'm going to plug. Uh, it's specifically Broward County, but if you're in another county and you see an injured manatee, it will pull up this number for you. Uh, so you can go ahead and report wherever you are in Florida. Um, important information that you'll want to know uh, and, and relate to the person that you get in touch with, uh, signs of injury or distress, the location, specifically a nearest boat ramp, because hopefully you can get there easily. Um, but I've seen people jump in on out of kayaks if they have to. Um, and the contact information to reach you. Okay, and then, so this is our contact information. This is me, um, my email and our natural resource website. And then below is for the aquatic and wetland resource program that specifically handles the permitting side of it um, with mangroves or wetland delineation and all that fun stuff. Uh, we're also on social media. We try to share about our programs and specific themes of our month, um, but I'm always posting Manatee Monday. So if you have any, um, you know, you need a good pick me up, hopefully I've got some kind of rescue video or a fun fact, but um, it, it's pretty much, that, that's all I have. So I just wanted to say thank you. I know most of you are volunteers um, listening in today and um, the animals thank you, the mangroves thank you, and I hope that I can answer any of your questions regarding anything. Let me know. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Little floaty potatoes. <laughs> um, if you have um, any material that you can give to us, we would happily, you know, be able to hand that out to the public because we do get some calls yeah. every now and then about, hey, I found 
um, you know, an injured manatee, because of course our thing just says injured, sick, and orphaned wildlife. So we do get a, a you know, a good amount of calls about other things that we unfortunately can't help with. But if you want to ever send me some stuff, um, we can hand out materials as well as, you know, again, like divert people to the proper place. Um, and then again, if there are opportunities for our volunteers or our community to get involved with, then definitely, you know, I'd love to share that because um, they are truly so cute and important. And I'm happy to see that they are, you know, that population is getting back up there. So it means that, you know, what you guys are doing is working, um, which is great. Um, definitely want to see that for some other species that we definitely admit uh, to the South Florida Wildlife Center, but we'll get there as well. So, but yeah, if you guys don't have any other questions, I will post this on our YouTube so you guys can check it out. Um, and you have my email and our access so we can always, uh, you know, get you guys connected. So I'm going to stop the recording. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all. That was good. I, yeah, I know I started off a little quick, but if you, as I said, my email, shoot me an email. Um, I can talk manatees all day. So do you, do you ever, <clears throat> excuse me, do you ever come to the schools? I do. I haven't because COVID was, you know, COVID. Right. Um, but no, I actually went out to, there was a, a, oh goodness, like an eco earth day fair at the college at Broward college I did, but, um, I did a library presentation the other week in, uh, was it Parkland? So I, I do, I, I like working with the little kids. I've got a one and five year old myself. So that's like my, my passion. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Can, can, do you have an, you have an email? I'm sorry. I, I okay. did not write that down. It's okay. The chat. Let me do that. Um, and yeah, and, and like I said, I, I work very closely with the sea turtle um, program manager. So we do joint presentations, um, but for the kids, I talk about career opportunities and ways that they can help um, general biology, you know, tell me the grade level and I can tailor the presentation. That, okay. Um, are you up for a challenge? Always. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, at, I'm at Pine Ridge. Um, which is the alternative center for those who have been expelled. Okay. Um, but I'm this, I'm the science teacher, science chair, and I would love, you know, I try to bring in like whatever I can mm -hmm. for the kids. And obviously we have security and you would not be, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you'd be fine. We have, our security is amazing, but I just would love to do something like that. Yeah, and I mean, we can give volunteer hours for that coastal cleanup. So if they need to do any community service, that's something that even if they do it on their own time as a group, uh, if they can document how many pounds of trash they cleaned up, I mean, I'll sign off on it or they, you know, we can do that. Um, my husband- they, they, You could, I mean, they. I think a lot of them might have POs, which you could work uh, out with them if, okay. if, you're, if you're interested. I'm not so sure about that, but um, you know, it'd be nice, I'm not sure. How many? I don't know who comes to me through the court or who comes to me through the public school, um, but I imagine some might. But I think you know, just hearing about careers would be oh, absolutely good. And yeah, yeah. And this, this, it's interesting because you know you don't have to be a science nut to get into and what like wildlife law. We have a lot of different officers that get to patrol and drive boats. And, you know, I mean, it's really, there's a lot of things out there or if they're really into art, I always push going into graphic design for exhibit design and things like that. So it, it, I, yeah, just shoot me an email and um, okay. you can come up with something. Okay. It might be like at some point later in the year, but yeah. I oh yeah, no, that's fine. And, yeah, that would be one, that'd be a wonderful thing that we could do. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I really appreciated this. Um, thank you guys for doing this. Our pleasure. All right, bye. All right, bye-bye. All righty, well, again, thank you, Samantha. It's truly appreciated. And thank you everyone else for joining us. Um, like I said, I'll go ahead and put this on our YouTube so I can share that for those who weren't able to join us live. Um, but we also have Broward County next month. We actually have our seed turtle uh, conservation program manager coming on board and she'll be talking a little bit more. So it's kind of an extension, um, you know, to this presentation. So hopefully we see you guys out next month as well. Um, so otherwise, uh, again, pleasure meeting you. It was great to have you. Um, and then, like I said, I'll be in touch via email about the YouTube link, but thank you guys and have a good one. Great. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. See you ladies.